Welcome to the Heart of Sirs podcast. I'm your hostess, Melanie Joy Pensack, here to share heartfelt conversations with folks recovering from Sirs and with those special people serving the Sirs community. The podcast was created to help bring awareness to the physical, emotional, and mental experiences of folks navigating Sirs day to day. The world needs to know what SIRS folks go through for deeper empathy and understanding. Through stories and vulnerability, we can help the world understand the winding journey of SIRS recovery. Thank you for being here to open your mind and to open your heart. Welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to have special guest Larry Schwartz with us today on the Heart of Sirs podcast. I'd love to tell you a little bit more about Larry's background. He is an indoor medically sound environmental engineer. He is the founder, CEO, and president of Safe Start Environmental and Safe Start Building Consulting Incorporated. Larry has performed over 10,000 investigations of properties for which he has investigated, created remediation plans, performed testing, and issued post-remediation verifications. Larry authored a chapter entitled Building Science and Human Health in a medical textbook titled Nutrition and Integrative Medicine for Clinicians, Volume 2, published by CRC Press. Larry is the sole environmental expert on a national study with a team of physicians on a research project into sources of causes for Alzheimer's and dementia patients. A specialty area is assessing, testing, and creating solutions to make homes and workplaces environmentally safe for patients with inflammatory illnesses. Many of his clients are patients referred by their physicians and clinics worldwide. He both travels to their sites as well as conducts virtual consulting. Larry's formal education is he has a BSME in engineering degree from Purdue University, an MBA from Northwestern University, and he has successfully passed the Indiana Professional Engineer Examination and the National and Illinois Professional Home Inspection Examinations. He has licensing in the state of Florida, as most other states have no license requirement. He was the first individual license to be in the state of Illinois to teach his proprietary and licensed mold course to licensed real estate practitioners. He has a certification as a certified indoor environmental consultant. He is a certified infrared thermographer, and he also has had many media appearances and speaking engagements. He consults with and patients of certified physicians and clinics with medical networks nationally and internationally. He is under contract for consulting research with the Air Answers Corporation. Larry is an expert witness in over 35 lawsuits involving water damage, mold and health issues in buildings and homes. This involves reviewing documents, on-site investigations, testing, reporting, depositions, and testimony at trials. He was the lead author of the original Surviving Mold Environmental Consensus Document, How to Perform Medically Sound Investigations and Remediation of Water Damaged Buildings, co-authored by Dr. Keith Bernstein and several other colleagues, which can be found on the Surviving Mold website. He is an author of the 2020 updated version of the peer-reviewed Surviving Mold Environmental Consensus Document. Thank you so much, Larry, for being here today and bringing your expertise to the Heart of SIRS community. We're glad that you're here. Thank you so much. I'm not a big ego guy, but it's exciting to hear that background and wonder myself sometimes how I got to that. But my passion is really helping people and solving puzzles. And it's just not a job. It's a passion. Thank you so much for sharing that passion with the world. And we are all very curious to know what led you to become an indoor environmental professional. IEP is the word that the initials that many will hear out in the community. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up working in this field and with SIRS patients. It's a long story, maybe longer than we have to talk about, but I'll (laughs) try to give you the short version. After I graduated college, 
I had a job at General Motors Proving Ground, which was really a fun, exciting short term because I did ROTC at college and I had a little over a two year stint in the Army in the Ordnance Corps. And I had that coming up six months after I graduated college. I was six months in Michigan with General Motors, went into the Army as an officer in the Ordnance Corps. And before I got out, I was discharged at Fifth Army headquarters in Chicago. My sister was living there at the time, and she was recently married. I grew up in the St. Louis area, and I had a lot of friends and fraternity brothers in the Chicago area and decided to stay in that neighborhood. I've been there all since that time, and I had industrial jobs. And although I was mainly with major companies like a manufacturing engineer and stuff like that. And even at that time, I had ideas and thoughts and I'd share with people that I, I didn't have the wherewithal or the funds to try any of that. But I think I've always been more of a entrepreneur type of personality. And I had dreams at that time of becoming rise high up in management in a big company and that type of thing. That's when I did my MBA at Northwestern at night school for five years. And I gained a lot of insight. It was a really helpful education. But through it all, I kind of enjoyed and liked the personalities of my workmates and all. I found ideas and things I would talk about. If they were worthwhile, we'd get kind of up the line and other people take credit for. And I didn't like that kind of deal. So I felt I was a square peg in a round hole, as they say, or vice versa. And when we started, we had our first child. I felt we needed more money. I started some part-time jobs. I, I hope I'm not boring you guys with this lengthy short story, but anyway, I'll continue. And I worked three, four nights a week at things like selling shoes at, at Sears, wrapping toys at Toys R Us, and, you know, jobs to help. And at that time, real estate was really booming. And I decided to take, get a real estate license. And that was really the biggest shift toward what I do now, because I started doing real estate part-time. I was still working as an engineer in industry. And I gave myself, I made a little graph of how many listings and sales I would need to make in a three-month period to see how that worked and make decisions where I go from there. And I far exceeded my goals and I really loved it. And I loved selling and learned a lot about sales in that time. And it was so fulfilling and, and even financially as well as, you know, at that time I started learning, I'm helping people meet a goal they need. I'm helping them fill their needs. And that was very helpful to me. I liked doing that. And I made a decision to go full-time into real estate and I set more goals and I did really well. And with some partners, I opened the a large company, a company that became large in the area and had done very well. And before long, changes in that industry, changes in the way of commissions and splits and the 100% firms and all that, found I was working harder and getting less. I wasn't getting tired of what I was doing. Along the same time, uh, I think it was around that, I don't know if you recall, I must have been 10, 15 years ago, in a suburb of Austin, Texas, named Dripping Springs, which is very ironic for a name where there was a big mold case. The Ballard case, B-A-L-A-R-D, hmm. was on the front page of national magazines and newspapers. It was a family in this town where this family won a $30 million lawsuit for mold in their home. And it was appealed, and it was knocked down to $4 million because... They found the courts felt they would give money for, for property damage, but there weren't enough associations of mold damage to health. So they knocked that portion out, those kind of penalties. And years later, in fact, with some attorneys I work with, they had me speak at some of the legal, what are called Harris Mealy seminars and all, the national stuff. One of them was down in Austin, Texas. I went to and they introduced me to Melinda Ballard, who was the person in that. I met Judge Dietz. 
I met who was then the attorney general, who's now the current governor of Texas. I had a meeting with Melinda Ballard and her family, but they have big physical outcomes from the mold. What it all boiled down to, the copper plumbing supply water plumbing in the house and the chemicals in the water caused pinhole leaks that caused unseen spring of water in the home. Her husband lost a lot of cognitive abilities and her son lost his hearing. And at a, at a meeting in Chicago, it was a National Association of Trier Lawyers Association. 12, 15 years ago, I was a speaker at that. It was a one-day seminar in Chicago. At that time, attorneys were deciding that they want to take on mold cases or not. What are the positives? What are the negatives? And I gave them, from my perspective, my spin on it. A lot of lawyers decided not to go that route. They're iffy. There's not a lot of history on how the courts are ruling on that. But anyway, that that's another little thing, another channel I got some diversion in. I'd given a talk at the Chicago Bar Association, the Illinois Bar Association, at one of the law schools. So these were the days shortly after the Ballard case. And the Ballard case it was big national stuff. It caused people and many people in California to even purposely flood their homes to create mold cases to get insurance coverage. Then the insurance companies started changing their policies to exclude a lot of stuff that they were previously including. To get back on how I got into this, that's the stuff that fired my passion. And around that time, from home inspection, the Ballard case inspired me that I started buying equipment to check water damage and mold stuff. And I started shifting my interest into mold investigations. And one of my clients who lived in a an upper suburb of Chicago called Hinsdale. I've been working with this lady. She has a family. Her husband wasn't believing all the stuff that she was suffering. And she was working with Dr. Keith Bernston, who was one of the early guys in the shoemaker camp who had an office in a suburb, Park Ridge, Illinois. And she kept telling me, you need to meet Keith. You need to meet Dr. Bernston. And for a year or so, I was busy. I was doing two, three, four investigations a day. But I finally called Keith and he invited me to lunch. And I had several lunches with him and we got along really well in our, our topics. And he started sending patients to me, his patients. And th they were recovering, most of them recovering very well. And the logic and pathways we worked on together worked well. He introduced me to Dr. Shoemaker. And Dr. Shoemaker, we had conversations, and at one point, Dr. Shoemaker asked if I'd like to head up and lead that document, that consensus document we're talking about. I didn't know what I was getting into. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I rapidly agreed, boy, this is a great fun opportunity. And it wound up almost a year and a half of working with five, six of my IEP colleagues and several physicians, Dr. Bernston, Dr. Shoemaker on that document. So we presented it at a, at a SERS conference years ago down in Phoenix. And from there, it just kept going. And just the excitement of new frontiers, solving puzzles, getting into the depth, understanding this, teaching it, and helping people just ignited a passion that just hasn't ended. In fact, the team members in, in our company, not one of us feels that what we're doing is a job. We love what we're doing. We all pitch in. We go over and above whatever we have to do to make it right. And I feel truly the role of an IEP that does this right, it's for two sides of the same coin with the physician. In order, the physicians help get the bad stuff out of the body. We help keep it from going in the body. If what goes in is equal or faster than what goes out, the tank never empties and the patient never gets well. So it's a real synergistic treatment to get things right. And we find it what's been working really well. So that's how I got to this. I'm grateful and feel blessed. I've had opportunities that have helped educate me and help people and get involved with colleagues that, that are helpful and we help each other. It's a great, I can't, when I, I rarely take the train anymore into the city, but to watch people 
with bored faces, read the newspapers and go to a job and punch a clock. You got to do what you got to do, but to feel blessed that you have something you can do that's helpful and you love to do. That's not the usual. Wow. Thank you for sharing all of that detail, Larry. I really appreciate it. It's so interesting to me to hear how their lives, these little bits and pieces of what they've been interested in or the jobs that they've had, how it eventually gets them to SIRS and the Shoemaker Protocol. And I didn't really know much about that history that you're talking about with the mold case and about people even flooding their own homes. And that's really an important point that I don't know that a lot of people are aware of, at least I wasn't. That's how then some of the rules got instated with insurance about leaving mold off of the insurance policies. It's really interesting to know the history of how these rules and ways come about. And Yeah, it's really interesting to me too. A lot of people, I feel like in the shoemaker world, they have all of these different skills that they're now bringing to SIRS patients. And it seems like such a benefit to know that you've had this varied background and now you can condense all of that to really serve this population. So thank you for that. Do you have a personal connection to SIRS or does anyone have the illness personally? Now, this is almost like a little continuation of this past story I told. About five, six years ago, one of my client patients named Michelle Fisher lived maybe about 40 miles from where I live, and I helped her in her house. Michelle was a very top-level special ed teacher in her community and had a lot of years and built up service. And she was a patient of Dr. Bernstein. That's how I got referred to her. And She's a SERS patient, and her daughter's a SERS patient, and the school had a mold issue, and it was so bad it was affecting her life that the school basically, it got to a point that was adversarial, that they pushed her around and ultimately pushed her out from teaching, and she still has long-term a legal case with them, but I don't want to divert full sidetrack on this. But we've worked with a lot of schools, some very pro. And most schools and government buildings are very defensive about mold. They won't do the testing right. They won't test when classrooms are in session. They use all what I call traditional methods that don't cover assessing inflammatory issues. And even with pictures, big pictures of big mold in the building, they bring their people in and they come up assessing that it's all okay. It's not a problem. It's amazing that it's like that. But to make a long story short on that, about five, six years ago, Michelle contacted me again and, you know, that she was going to start this legal thing. Could I help in any way? So I came down and visited her and I talked about what I was doing now and how things were growing and I need some help. Would she be willing part-time to help? She's now really running the day-to-day operation right now and very happy and doing very well with it. And she's doing very well with her SIRS, and she still maintains that. But yes, you ask me, do I have connections to people with SIRS? I'd say Michelle and her daughter and others, you know, we've worked with that we've maintained close relationships with. I, I don't want to go off on a total tangent, but I have a very strong passion of letting the world know that there's a really serious epidemic and how things are not being treated in the right way. Can I divert a little? Sure. Yeah, I would be happy to hear your thoughts. We know from Dr. Shoemaker, and it's very reliable, that at least 24% of the population have the vulnerable genes that they can develop SIRS issues based on environments and water damage and some other stressors. And think of this, the families living in homes, apartments, whatever, if there's four or more people in those homes, the odds are that at least one or more of that family are going to be vulnerable to these issues. So let's say they have a mold issue, a pipe breaks, they call in XYZ, the National Franchise Remediator, they clean it up, they dry it up, they treat the mold, they use mold killers, chemicals, fungicides, they do post, they bring in an expert to do a mold guy to do mold testing. They'll do spore trap air testing compared to outdoors. Everything's good. They restore. Life goes on. 
but it's not good for those vulnerable people. If they don't even know it, they're going to onset symptoms because of these chemicals, the, the way containments are set up. So the methods of assessment and treatment of homes with water damage are dangerous to families and people right now because people that have vulnerabilities are going to get affected and don't even know it. Myself and colleagues have developed treatments that are safe for inflammatory patients that, that will not trigger their symptoms. And yet 99% of all remediations going on in this country are vulnerable to susceptible people, and it's a high number. I've written years ago, I wrote about 10 or 15 reasons why this should be, this information needs to get to the public. I sent it to both print and air media outlets. Didn't get one response. Even associations, potential associations with Alzheimer's couldn't get one response. And the general thinking is the big pharma, the big med, and all of these groups, it's, it's all bottom line thinking. And, and the world suffers. And we wonder why there's so much illness going on. Of the millions that have this vulnerability, so many don't even know it, and they're not being treated right. They're getting the symptoms treated, hopefully, but not getting the causes done. So I have a very strong passion to get whatever information out to the public as possible. Even doing these podcasts and everything, I'm hopeful, will, will help unlock that secret. Thank you so much for bringing that into the conversation. I know you mentioned with Michelle that schools and governments can be defensive when we bring up these types of issues. And another person that becomes defensive when you might bring up mold would be the landlord. <laughs> and I brought you onto this podcast today to dive a little bit more deeply into this area of being a renter. And so I'm hoping that we can transition and start to unpack some of that together right now. Some of the background for the listeners, you know, I am a renter. I've been a renter for many years. That suited my lifestyle very well. Bit of a vagabond and like to travel about and take opportunities all around the country and the world. Renting has always just been the way that I have lived. And what you're touching on about not knowing causing damage, I do believe that's a part of my story where I have lived in basement apartments that have had funky smells over the years. I've lived above garages that I don't really know what was being brought into my living space from that garage because there was no control over what was in that garage. I've loved living in old row houses in Chicagoland area in Washington, D.C. So there are all of these types of housing that can have issues that I didn't know could be an issue for me because I didn't know my genetic susceptibility. And so a lot of people listening to me also are renters. We know it's difficult to buy a house in these economic times with the interest rates the way they are. And as we talked about a little bit, Larry, it's just not always the right fit to be a homeowner. And so I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about what are some practical things that the renting population should consider. And I can also share some of my own experiences in that area. But you're the expert in things like the stack effect and what should people look for in their bathroom and around washing machines, just red flags. And how can we sort of manipulate a space to be good enough for our healing? Great area, great questions. I've worked with many renters and those that rent and, and go to another place and what should I look for? How do I minimize my risk? And I would say in most cases, it's a mixed bag on the owners, on the landlords, whether they're going to be trying to be helpful and understanding or not. Just in that in general, if you're in a big city and you're going into a big rental building kind of a place, there's probably a group of investors that own it. There's a management company you deal with as a renter. And some of those cases, they're understanding and helpful or not. One thing I recommend you do, and not spend a lot of time in research, but try to get a feel of who you're dealing with as your landlord. And I've worked with many 
where the landlords want to be as helpful as they can and try to be understanding. And I work with many where it's just just up against a brick wall. You can't get to the first base. And it can be tough. And even on the lease, depending on the strength of the rental market, I have had clients, and I've suggested this, and I'm by no means a lawyer, but I understand a lot about it. I've worked with them a lot. To see if you can get a little clause put in the lease, you have a particular type of illness. And if after testing, you find this building is not suitable for your health, that you can get like maybe a one, two, three month window that you can get out of your lease. And I I know it sounds nuts, but I've seen a lot of landlords say, okay. But you're also being fair by giving the landlord enough time to release the place. Yeah, Yeah, that is a fantastic suggestion. I know that the place that I got sick in, I was able to get out of the lease by having a Ermi hurts me result that wasn't optimal. And I sat down with them and explained what was happening to my health. And it was a private landlord. So it was an extension of their house. So he was willing to sit down and have a conversation with me, but was definitely not willing to do any sort of investigation or remediation. So his option for me was, well, we'll let you out of the lease and we'll give you back your security deposit as soon as you find another place. And that for me was good enough because I ultimately said, okay, we're not willing. You're being straight. It's a good outcome. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So for people out there too, know that if you are in a lease and you want to get out of it, sometimes a test or a doctor's note along with a test can be a way and you can just get out and not lose any money. Great idea. So think about the type of buildings and think about what's going on around the building. I was in a an older three-level basement vintage building in Chicago. There's a, an alley running alongside the building. And among other things in the investigation, uh, I was measuring electromagnetic fields. And it was interesting, one floor alone had high fields and all the others didn't. And I looked out the window and there was this huge brand new replaced electrical transformer on a pole right across the window in the alley. And by doing other measurements, I found out this transformer was the issue. If you're in a rental building before you sign a lease, look out your window. I've been in high-rise rental units in north of downtown Chicago, for example, got really incredibly high EMFs near these big floor-to-ceiling windows. And looking out, Looking out one window across two, three blocks was a transmitting tower on top of the Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower. Looking out another direction, about a quarter mile away, there was a transmitting tower. So be aware of what's around the area you're going to rent. Or because outdoor things and sources do come into buildings besides what's inside. Okay, now, in rentals, you, you, you're going to rent anything like a single family home, a room in a home. You might be renting a low rise, two story apartment building. You might be renting a townhouse. You might be renting a mid rise, 10, 11, 12, 15 stories. You might be renting in a high rise. Some general things to think about. I would suggest if possible, not to pick a unit that faces to the north. Now think of this, in the winter, the sun is in the south. So the north side gets colder, you're more likely to get microbial growth in the building envelope on the north side. And even in homes in the attics where we find mold, most of it will grow from condensation on the north side because of what I'm telling you. That's Mm -hmm. if you're in a colder climate. It may not be that way in a southern climate or such. Okay, another thing to think about is I recommend you try avoid both the ground floor and the top floor. The top floor has risk of roof issues and roof leaks. The ground floor has more potential issues of things outdoors at the ground level that get sucked in the building because of stack effect in the building. Think of this. You never, ever think of it when you go in an office building to see a lawyer, a doctor, a business, whatever, that you're either going to go through a revolving door or a vestibule with another set of doors. You never think, why are they doing this? Why is the builder spending more money to do this kind of a thing? 
the higher the building, the higher the pressure differential of stack effect. If you were in that building and you wanted to go outdoors and you didn't have that vestibule or revolving door, you probably wouldn't have the strength to push the door open because of the stack effect in the building. It's a real deal. And even in high rises, we find high rising air in elevator shafts, in common hallways, and it's created a suction in the hallways, in apartments, in, me in medium and high rise. You might see in a kitchen and a bathroom what looks like a ceiling vent, maybe kind of circular with louvers in it, and it's not a fan. You don't really think, well, what is that? What it is, is that codes say these apartments have to allow ventilation of air. And maybe you have non-openable windows or such. You need ventilation. These vents in the ceiling connect to vents and tubes that go out through the roof of the building because stack effect goes through there sucking air up to create ventilation. And where does the replacement air come from? It comes from hallways around the doors, around common elements. You could be in a really great apartment, and if the hallways and common elements aren't good, you could be getting bad air sucked in through the common elements because of the ventilation system. More than you ever wanted to think about or dream about, but this is the real deal how it works. And there's ways to help counter that. I'm going to mention some of those. One thing you want to look at is how is my apartment heated? Is it radiator baseboard heat? Is it electric heat? Is it water heat? If it's forced air, do I have my own air handler, furnace air conditioner, or is it shared with other units? If it's shared with other units, you have real potential problems. Even if there aren't problems, water damage in those other units, maybe somebody, you know, their habits and their cleaning and all, they're just not clean people. Maybe they're smokers and there's not a lot of laws against I've worked with tenants in buildings where they were getting sick from smokers and other units. Even if you look under the kitchen and bathroom sink where the pipes go through, they're not sealed openings. And we found that's where the smoke was coming in through. And there's not a lot of smoke habitability laws that can be in effect. And by the way, also be aware, counties, cities, for almost for sure counties have habitability laws for rental. And you should take a look at that just to know what your rights are, because there are habitability laws that landlords have to provide, regardless of what their lease says. So it's, it's just another angle to get a look at. But I think one of the major deals is how is the place heated and air conditioning? What is the ventilation? If you have a choice of windows, uh, I prefer you get a place with windows that can open and not seal. I prefer you have a type of heating system so it's not one of these through wall heater air conditioner deals that generally are dirty inside, filters aren't changed. When I've done testing of air coming out of window air conditioners even, uh, I don't think I've ever gotten good results of air coming out of any of those because they really have to be cleaned inside and maintained and filter changed. In the air conditioning season, condensation occurs in those. It doesn't always drain out well. And there's materials in there that can mold. Even many split units have to be cleaned and maintained well. And you may see many splits more these days in units. They're great that we should don't have dirty duct work to deal with, but they're not all free and clear either. They need to be maintained. These are wonderful. I just want to jump in on this topic before you continue more. I have in my apartment building completed something called a reasonable accommodation request. And so I reached out for free legal advice in my state. If you Google free legal advice, you can often get a consultation with a lawyer and explain maybe what you need help with for the laws that the landlord has or the rights that you have to get some more information on how to even bring something like this up. And I was able to just get some free legal advice on how to fill out this reasonable accommodation request so that I could change the air filter in my private HVAC more frequently, that I could use a higher level filter in the HVAC than what they would provide. And so the maintenance person now comes up once a month for me, and I change my air filter once a month, and I clean out the carbon filter that brings in the outside air once a month. 
he gives me the stink eye every time that we do this. You'd think by now he'd be over it, but he looks at the air filter. And I say to him every time, can you see the microscopic particles in this air filter? Because he's sort of saying to me like, lady, there's nothing on here. This filter isn't dirty. And I say to him every time, can you see the microscopic particles on that? This is so typical of what we all deal with. Yeah, I find humor in it now because I know I'm in the right and I'm protecting my health. But there are some ways once if you get into a place and you think, okay, I want to make some of these accommodations, you might have some legal support out there that you can find. It takes a little digging. And so you can go to the landlord with, hey, these are the fair housing rights. I know I can make this request. Let's work together on this. Do they always want to do it? No, there are some things that they wouldn't give me a request for, but you have to take your wins where you can. So I've been in a number of high rises where there's like a vertical rectangular opening in a wall that has a metal cover over it. And inside is an air handler or let's say hot water boiler is down in the basement of the building and it comes through pipes in this air handler in different units and air blows over these warm pipes to heat the air. And it's not like there's a fan motor or anything. Oh yeah, there's a fan motor there to blow the air, but it's not like it's its own furnace kind of a deal. They're like shared type of heat. But the key is we don't want to share air with other units. Those type of units are okay. And generally in those closets, things need to be clean. Sometimes there's old insulation there that's pretty grungy that probably should be addressed with some cleanup. But I think one of the main things, and before I can give you some thoughts of what you specific things you can do in using your rental apartment or home that will be helpful air quality wise, I want to tell you my little shoebox story. So it's a quick little analogy, but it points out a lot of things. And after I tell you the story, I'll tell you what its meanings are and takeaways. Picture you and are your family. You live in the back half of a giant, brand new, shiny, clean, empty shoebox. And halfway across the shoebox, you have four or five air filters running. We'll just call them purifiers for the moment. And each one of those has a capacity of what they can take out of the air. And they're all running at full speed. And at the far end wall of the box, for some unknown reason to the occupants, occasionally a sandstorm emits and travels through to the other end of the box. Now, when the sandstorm is very light or medium, those air filters have the capacity to take all that sand out of the air before it gets into your living space and you're still living there, very happy. And when that sandstorm gets heavy, some of the sand gets past the filters because they each have limited capacity. And maybe the level of sand hasn't triggered your symptoms yet. It hasn't reached your sensitivity levels. You're still all living very happy. Now, when that sandstorm comes out very heavy, a heavier load gets back to where you're living, triggers your symptoms. Oh my, what do we do now? We're going to open a window on each side of our living space, put a fan in one blowing air out, pull fresh air in from the other, and blow the remaining sand out of the room so we can be happy again. There's some very interesting takeaways. Number one is the contamination in the air you breathe isn't always consistent and steady all the time. It varies. It can be light. It can be heavy. It can be medium. The wall the sand comes out of represents a source of the bad stuff. The air filters represent air purification. Fan in the window represents ventilation. Correction works like this. Step one, let's find and stop the walls that are creating the sand. Let's stop the sources. Let's find them, minimize them. B, you're never going to live in a clean room, so you're always going to have some level of sand. Goal is to keep that level below your sensitivity trigger levels. You're never going to live in a place without sand. C, the first line of defense is air purification. So if the level of sand is low enough, air purifiers alone may solve the problem. A lot of people think, okay, I'm going to go out and buy this incredible air filter. It's going to solve my problem. Maybe not. Depends on the level of sand and the frequency of it. And the last step, if you get your 
sand level as controlled as possible and you use your air purifiers and it's still not good enough, now we have to deal with ventilation. And in an apartment, like in a home, if you have a forced air system or don't, we can install something. We meaning in, in general, not me. We, we have team members that specialize in how to do this stuff. You can add like a power ventilation system to create four to five air changes per hour in the home. You can adjust air pressure differentials to keep that outdoor stuff out with that. So now you're in an apartment, you don't have control of doing this. So if you have windows that are openable, more ideally double hung, but a lot of them are crank or sliders, and there's ways to deal with it. We have a protocol that's simple, and I'll give you a quick explanation. We've had a lot of renter clients that have had fairly immediate good health effects by doing this. So it's amazing. If you go, and I have no stock in Amazon, if you go to Amazon and you in the search bar, you put window fans, you'll find about 10 pages of very unique looking window fans that range from about $30 to $100. And you've probably seen these type that have little fans in it and a cardian sides that you can open a window, set it to blow air out, say, out of your bedroom. And we give instruction like, to do this maybe two, three times a day, 15 to 30 minutes at a time. And then you open the door and open a window in another room. You go back to Amazon in the search bar, you put Merv 13 filter cloth. You get a little bolt of cloth for $18, $20 that filters to Merv 13 level. You get white blue painter's tape. The window you open for makeup air, just like in the shoebox story, you take blue painter's tape and tape that filter on the window where incoming air, so you pre-filter the incoming air. You can create this ventilation. Remember this. I don't mean this to be funny, but we need a little humor. I don't think you're going around licking the walls or smelling the walls all day. It's in the air you breathe. We need to get these air changes because whatever level of bad stuff in the air has triggered your symptoms, we can now blow that out and replace it with cleaner air to reduce those levels of bad stuff in the air. It works. Between your own filtration and ventilation, you can really make your apartment a lot more habitable. I could go in more detail on that or whatever, but I'm giving you the basic concepts. But I do need to tell you this. There's two types of air purification. There's filtration, which is just what it sounds like. You trap particles in the air down to certain sizes and filters. You take them out of the air. Good thing. You hear these PCO devices, such as products made by Air Oasis and other companies, and they work a little differently. They do have filters that do filter particles, but basically they create a simple products that create a chemical reaction with gaseous contaminants that they create. You've probably had at least some degree of high school chemistry. Obviously, you know, H2O is water. OH isn't water, but it wants to be water. It wants to be H2O. It's unstable. So these devices create OH molecules that go in the air with an electrical charge. And they'll attach to gaseous particles, and they'll grab an atom of carbon or hydrogen from the gas to make H2O or CO2. By so doing, they decontaminate the gaseous contaminant. They work especially well with things like VOCs and chemicals. I like combinations of both, but you don't want machines that create ozone because ozone, which is an oxygen molecule with three atoms instead of two, it wants to oxidize anything it comes in contact with. It can do DNA damage to lung tissue and concentration. And we have evidence with data that it can exacerbate inflammatory symptoms, even at very low levels. So any products you buy, they're called PCO, photocatalytic catalytic oxidation. You want it to be a wavelength of UV called C, like Charlie, that doesn't create ozone. Many of them do. The iAdaptairs don't create ozone. But don't expect just because you buy one iAdaptair or any filter, like the shoebox story, not necessarily the magic bullet. It'll help. Going back yeah, to the apartments, I'm trying to think what else to keep in mind when you're looking to rent. As far as air filters, 
There's a lot of good ones, but I want you to understand this. The size of the openings in your lower lungs to the bloodstream get down to what we call like 0.1, 0.2 micron in size. Those are millionths of a meter. You hear the term HEPA all the time. HEPA means 0.3. Now, a good HEPA filter will filter to a fair degree smaller than 0.3, but there are two, three brands of air filters that filter close to 100 times smaller than HEPA, such as the IQ Air, IntelliPure, Air Doctor. I have one client who is a really good business analyst who did a five-year projection of cost of IQ Air Health Pro Plus versus Air Doctor. And it came out in five years, the IQ Air was less money because of the less frequent filter changes required. I'm not telling you what to do. And if you have these filters, you can move them around. You don't have to keep them static in a room. Every other day or so, move them to a different quadrant. They have a reach of air they can bring in, so you can better homogenize things, moving them around move them from room to room even. I don't mean like every hour, but maybe every two, three days, whatever. It'll be helpful. I think in an apartment, a good air filter and one that will allow some ventilation, try avoid the north side if you can. Try not be right under the roof. Try be not that close to an elevator in a hallway where there's a lot of air suction. And look at the hallway. Look at the common elements. Is it all grungy carpeting in the hallway? Maybe you might even want to do a little test. I don't want it to be a full method of test. I know in the shop on our site or on Amazon, you can get a little handheld particle counter for $100, $150. And you can measure particle densities in the hallway versus inside the unit or room to room. That's another good thing in your hunt, whether it's for a rental or an ownership. There's two, three tools I recommend that are each maybe in the $100 range to a type of dual mode moisture meter, an air quality meter that measures particles, formaldehyde levels. I think it's almost mandatory you do some of this to make sure you're not going into a trap. You're going to sign a lease for a year. And what the other meter is, you know, an electro, an EMF meter. And interesting, EMF radiation diminishes the fourth route of distance. It diminishes pretty quickly, but if it's stronger, if you're in an apartment, set it near a window and then walk toward the middle of the room. See how that level changes. Maybe put it on the floor and raise it up to breathing level. See how that changes. If you have a common wall with a neighbor, they may have a whole bunch of electronics on that wall on the other side, zapping EMFs in your place. Put it along the walls and walk toward the middle of the room. Put it near electrical outlets and move away. If the neutral or ground wires aren't hooked up right, I've seen incredible high EMFs in homes just because of what's coming out of the electrical outlets. I've even seen it in new construction where things aren't wired right. We could go on and on, but I think I've covered the basic hot spots that could really help you. These are very helpful. And I'm sure all our listeners can tell that Larry has an endless amount of information on this. And I think it points to the fact that These are great general tips and ideas and things to keep in mind that you might not already be thinking about compared to the more obvious look for bubbling or a smell or things like that. And they can be equally as important on your recovery, in your recovery process. But I think it it points to the fact that having a personalized assessment or consultation can be exceptionally valuable once you get into a place. You know, my physician really encouraged me to find a place that was good enough. And then to that tested well, for me, it was on my hurts me actinos and endos because of my presentation, but then to really consider how to then even improve it once inside. And I think this is a real rental dilemma for people. Like what is good enough? Because sometimes that search for perfection impairs you from ever getting into a clean enough place. And so it's different for everybody and every unit is different. So if you can get into a place that sort of has good enough numbers and then work with an indoor environmental professional to improve it even a little bit more with some of these other pieces for your own HVAC, your windows, your bathroom, your pipes, 
it can make a difference and help just to keep your environment healthy over, even if you're renting for several years while you recover before you look into something that may be more permanent. It can be a, a solid investment to help keep your place as healthy as possible once you're in it. One other tip I just thought of that might be helpful, and this isn't going to vary, you're not going to get it the same with every landlord, is maybe you see a place you think you would like and you want to do your own testing on it or talking about to see if they'll give you, and maybe even with a refundable deposit, to get a three to five day period to do your due diligence and hold the space available for you. I've had some tricky situations with landlords and apartment hunting where there isn't a lot of apartment inventory. Step aside next. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's been interesting. I think I'll share just a couple tips about that. And then if anybody wants to reach out to me, I work with people one-on-one too to help them problem solve some situations like this. But basically landlords, sometimes they can feel uncertain about you after you might say that you have an illness or something and rental discrimination is real. Like I found a tiny home that was really new that I wanted to move into. And the guy I talked to was so nice. He was a really kind person. And I made the mistake of trusting and telling a little bit about my history so I could get my dust sample done. And then after I paid and the sample was sent in and I was waiting for the results, he said he talked to his wife and they felt like it wasn't the right fit just because they didn't want to take a risk with my health history. And while that's definitely rental discrimination, a lot of the bigger landlord companies, if you say something about having an illness or mold, they can just easily say somebody else looked at it before you. And then you have no way to have legal ramifications. And So what I have done is I'll go into a place, I sort of do my visual and my body test to see how I'm responding to the environment. I do a VCS before I go in, and then I do a VCS four hours later. I'm lucky I respond to the VCS. And that's important because there are inflammatory markers that sometimes take hours to then impact your VCS test. So doing it, in my opinion, before and then at least four hours after is important to get a most accurate reading of how you're responding to that environment, caveat being if you respond to the VCS test. But I'll go in and I'll say, oh, you know, I just want a couple minutes to take some pictures and feel into the space. I'm really liking it. And most landlords that I've experienced, they're on their phones, they're busy, and they'll either be in the kitchen sort of like on their phone. Okay, yeah, look around, do your thing. Or they'll step out and make a phone call or do something else. And that gives me this five to 10 minute window that I'm seeing if I really like and feel into the space. And I've got my glove in my pocket. I have my dust sample in my pocket and I stealth go through and do my dust collection through the apartment. And I've done this multiple times and then gotten a good read. And then I'll say to the landlord afterwards, oh yeah, I'm really liking it. I'm going to need a couple days to figure it out if that's okay. And send it overnight and try to get as fast as a response on my dust sample as possible. Yeah, there's some ways and some tricks that I've learned along the way, because unfortunately, not everybody is willing to work with you once you say you have allergies or an illness. And I would definitely not recommend saying mold at all. (laughs) Yeah, but so great information. And I think there's so much more we could say, of course, but I'd love to start to wrap it up and just finish with a couple more general questions that I like to ask people if you're okay with that, Larry. Sure, by our way. Yeah, two more questions for you. I'd just love to know, you know, what are you most proud of related to this work? You've contributed a lot to the world and to the SERS community. What really resonates for you? We recently had an opportunity the last year to assess mold in an 87,000 square foot public building, a courthouse in downstate Illinois. And we got into this because an attorney down there, who's a patient of one of the shoemaker doctors, when he goes in that courthouse, gets sick, the attorney has serves. And it turns out that we did a survey before we actually got the, the, the commission to do this work. We sent out a written survey to the occupants of the building, the workers, about 130 of them, got 113 back. 
70 percent of them were affected in health in the building. And of those, 40 percent of those 70 percent were more inflammatory, which kind of fits into statistics. And in this town, there's not a lot of jobs available. And these people have built up pensions and things that work in the building. And powers that be that had this governmental committee hire us was the committee that was responsible for the maintenance and health of the building. So it became very adversarial when the results came back. We sent a team with four investigators. I got down there and helped set it up. We're there three and a half days taking both spore trap stuff, inflammatory tests, Hermes, fungi tens, particle counts, VOCs, the whole deal, visuals. And of the 25 so work areas, all but two of them were basically toxic for people with vulnerabilities. And when we presented all this, they had people there we didn't even know trying to diminish us. And it became very adversarial. There were no lawsuits issued or anything. It might have gotten close. There was lots of local TV and print media going on for months about it in that town. And the committee that hired us tried to steal my idea. I wanted to set up a town hall meeting for all residents and occupants and whoever to have the truth explained to them and what it means. And I had three of the physicians and the surviving mole group join with me in this town hall meeting. We had probably close to 150 in this town hall Zoom meeting, and we did a, a really good presentation of facts and potential health effects, some ideas on what should be done. And I feel this was a real crowning achievement because we not only learned a lot in how we assess this complicated, it was a very complex, complicated building. Airfoil was like an air handler on one level, produced air on another level. You can't even close off a level at a time to do treatment. It was just a very complex building. It was about 50 years old. On our whole team, I feel we rose above. It took a lot of courage to do what we did, and we took risks. And we feel we did the right thing, and we helped a lot of people. Some of the outcomes so far on that, one of the SERS docs is working with eight or 10 of those occupants and, and doing good with them. Some of them have left the building. Some of them have given up their pensions to leave. This was a real human story. Yeah. I feel we really helped a lot of people. And I feel proud of our whole team and myself. that We had the courage to stand up for the truth. Wow. That's really impactful. It really hits my heart. Thank you so much for being an ally to those people and a voice for so many that don't know why they are sick really brings me to our last question for the SERS community. What is your deepest wish for our SERS community? Yeah, my deepest wish is, first of all, the obvious one, that we want the world to be better and people to be healthier. But my most realistic wish, I would really like to see the truth of all of this be exposed to the world or society, that the blinders come off, that we can really all get together and understand this so we can all work together and make it better. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Larry, for being here and taking the time to share your wisdom today and share your heart and for being such a great voice in this community and for all the work that you do. I'll tell you, I feel very honored to do what I'm doing and to have opportunities like this to kind of spread the word and people understand it and get it right. And wish we all in the world could be honest and truthful. It would be really helpful. But this is all helping. I feel we're going in the right direction. Thanks. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my thoughts on this stuff. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Larry, how can people stay in touch with you if they want to work with you more? Sure. And understand, you know, we're not a super large group. You might have a little bit of a wait time if you want to go that way. And I do want to say I have very good, knowledgeable colleagues as well. And it's a big group. There's a lot of demand. We all want to do what we can. You could contact us. Our main number is 847-913-9200. 
847-913-9200. You can also contact us through contact on our website, Safe Start IAQ, like for indoor air quality, safestartiaq.com. And we'll do our best. We, we truly want to help everybody we can. And even people that maybe don't have the wherewithal or the funds to do it, if possible, we try to come up with alternate ways of trying to do the best that can be done. And I just want you to know, if I ever win Powerball or Lotto, the major funds are going to go into helping people with this. I love that. <laughs> May that be so. May Larry yeah. win the lottery. <laughs> so anyway, again, I love this opportunity and sharing these experiences and hope this is going to help a big group of you in your searches for housing. Just keep your eyes and ears open. Have enough knowledge, what, know what to look for. I mentioned that it was in the real estate game, and I learned this. People buy the housing they want, whether it's a buyer or a rental, based on the emotional impact and feel of that housing to them. And all their facts of what their needs are can go out the window. If you don't mind, let me give one quick example. Yeah. It's a, an interesting story. That's this, this one couple bought the home. It wasn't the number of bedrooms they wanted. It wasn't the number of baths they wanted. But the swing on the tree in the backyard brought back emotional memories of childhood that wow. made them buy that home. So try to keep your emotional appeal out of the equation when deciding where to live. Yeah, that is a great tidbit and piece of advice. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much again and be well, everybody. Thank you for listening and for your kind attention. To keep in touch, follow the Heart of Sirs podcast on Instagram. You can visit melaniepensack.com forward slash the Heart of Sirs to donate. Your generosity helps to keep this podcast growing. May the awareness of Sirs spread far and wide, helping to change millions of lives for the better.